What is Prayer? by Theophon the Recluse. What is prayer? What is its essence? How can we learn to pray? What does the spirit of the Christian experience as he prays in humility of, of heart? All such questions should constantly occupy the mind and heart of the believer, for in prayer man converses with God, he enters through grace into communion with him and lives in God. And the Holy Fathers and teachers of the Church give answers to all these questions based on the grace given enlightenment which is acquired through the experience of practicing prayer. Experience equally accessible to the simple and to the wise. Prayer is the test of everything. Prayer is also the source of everything. Prayer is the driving force of everything. Prayer is also the director of everything. If prayer is right, everything is right. For prayer will not allow anything to go wrong. There are various degrees of prayer. The first degree is bodily prayer, consisting for the most part in reading, in standing, and in making prostrations. In all this, there must needs be patience labor and sweat for the attention runs away the heart feels nothing and has no desire to pray yet in spite of this give yourself a moderate rule and keep to it such is active prayer the second degree in prayer is prayer with attention the mind becomes accustomed to collecting itself in the hour of prayer and prays consciously throughout without distraction the mind is focused upon the written words to the point of speaking them as if they were its own. The third degree is prayer of feeling. The heart is warmed by concentration so that what hitherto has only been thought now becomes feeling. Where first it was a contrite phrase, now it is contrition itself. And what was once a petition in words is transformed into a sensation of entire necessity. Whoever has passed through action and thought to true feeling will pray without words, for God is God of the heart, so that the end of apprenticeship in prayer can be said to come when in our prayer we move only from feeling to feeling. In this state, reading may cease, as well as deliberate thought. Let there be only a dwelling in feeling, with specific marks of prayer. When the feeling of prayer reaches the point where it becomes continuous, then spiritual prayer may be said to begin. This is the gift of the Holy Spirit praying for us, the large degree of prayer which our minds can grasp. But there is, they say, yet another kind of prayer which cannot be comprehended by our mind, and which goes beyond the limits of consciousness. On this reads St. Isaac the Syrian. Without inner spiritual prayer there is no prayer at all, for this alone is real prayer, pleasing to God. It is the soul within the words of prayer that matters, whether the prayer is at home or in church. And if inner prayer is absent, then the words have only the appearance and not the reality of prayer. What then is prayer? Prayer is the raising of the mind and heart to God in praise and thanksgiving to Him, and in supplication for the good things that we need, both spiritual and physical. The essence of prayer is therefore the spiritual lifting of the heart towards God. The mind in the heart stands consciously before the face of God, filled with due reverence, and begins to pour itself out before Him. This is spiritual prayer, and all prayer should be of this nature. External prayer, whether at home or in church, is only prayer's verbal expression and shape. The essence or the soul of the prayer is within a man's mind and heart. All our church order of prayer 
all prayers composed for home use, are filled with spiritual turning to God. Anyone who prays with even the least part of attention cannot avoid this spiritual turning to God unless he is completely inattentive to what he is doing. Nobody can dispense with inner prayer. We cannot live spiritually unless we raise ourselves in prayer to God. But the only way we can thus raise ourselves is through spiritual action. For God is spiritual. True, there is spiritual prayer linked with oral or exterior prayer, whether at home or in church, and there is also spiritual prayer. By itself, without any special outward form or bodily posture, but in both cases, the essence of the thing is the same. Both forms are obligatory for the layman as well as the monk. The Savior commanded us to enter into our closet and there pray to God the Father in secret. This closet, as interpreted by St. Dimitri of Rostov, means the heart. Consequently, to obey our Lord's commandment, we must pray secretly to God with the mind and the heart. This commandment embraces all Christians. The Apostle Paul gives this direction when he says, Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. He means spiritual prayer of the mind and directs all Christians, without distinction, to pray thus. He also directs all Christians to pray without ceasing, But unceasing prayer is only possible by praying with the mind and the heart. Rising in the morning, stand as firmly as possible before God in your heart as you offer your morning prayers, and then go to the work apportioned to you by God without withdrawing from Him in your feelings and consciousness. In this way, you will do your work with the powers of your soul and body, but in your mind and heart, who will remain with God. Outward prayer alone is not enough. God pays attention to the mind, and they are no and they are no true monks who fail to unite exterior prayer with inner prayer. Strictly defined, the word monk means a recluse, a solitary. Whoever has not withdrawn within himself is not yet a recluse. He is not yet monk even though he lives in the most isolated monastery. The mind of the ascetic, who is not withdrawn and enclosed within himself, dwells necessarily amongst tumult and unquietness. Innumerable thoughts, having free admission to his mind, bring this about. Without purpose or necessity, his mind wanders painfully through the world, bringing harm upon itself. The withdrawal of man within himself cannot be achieved without the help of the concentrated prayer, especially the attentive prayer of the Jesus prayer. The achievement of passionlessness and sanctity, in other words, of Christian perfection, is impossible without acquiring inner prayer. All the fathers are agreed on this. The path of true prayer becomes incomparably more narrow when the ascetic struggler begins to enter upon it through the activity of the inner man. But when he enters this narrow path and feels how right, saving, and necessary this way, this way is, and when he comes to love his work in the inner cell, then he will also come to love the narrowness of his exterior life because it serves as a cloister and treasury of inner activity. In psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the the Lord. The words in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs describe oral prayer, prayer with words. The words singing with grace in your heart to the Lord describe inner prayer, the mind and the heart. Psalms, canticles, hymns, odes, and so on are different names for religious songs. It is difficult to indicate the difference between them because their contents and form are very similar. All are expressions of the spirit of prayer. When moved to to pray, when moved to prayer, the spirit glorifies God. 
thanks him, and raises its petitions to him. All these manifestations of the spirit of prayer are essentially indivisible, having no separate existence. When prayer begins to work, it passes from one of these manifestations to another, often more than once. Expressed in words, it is oral prayer, whether called a psalm, a hymn, or an ode. Therefore, we will make no attempt to define the difference between their names. The Apostle intended by this phrase to embrace all kinds of prayer expressed in words. All prayers which are now in use come under this heading. Besides the Psalter, we use church songs, stachera, toperia, canons, akathist, and the various prayers which are contained in our prayer books. You will not go wrong if, when reading the Apostles' words about oral prayer, you will understand this as the oral prayer which we use today. The power of prayer lies not in this or that oral prayer, but in the way in which we pray. In his use of the word spiritual, the Apostle shows us how we should pray orally. Prayers are spiritual because they are originally born in the Spirit and ripen there, and are poured out from the Spirit. Their spiritual nature is intensified because they are born and ripened by the grace of the Holy Spirit. Psalms and all other oral prayers were not oral at the very beginning. In their origin they were purely spiritual, and only afterwards came to be clothed in words, and so assumed an oral form. But becoming oral did not deprive them of their spirituality. Even now, they are oral only in their outer semblance, but in their power, they are spiritual. It follows from this that if you want to learn from the Apostles' words about oral prayer, you must act thus, enter into the spirit of the prayers which you hear and read, reproducing them in your heart, and in this way offer them up from your heart to God, as if they had been born in your heart under the action of the grace of the Holy Spirit. Then, and then alone, is the prayer pleasing to God. How can we attain to such prayer? Ponder carefully on the prayers which you have to read in your prayer book. Feel them deeply. Even learn them by heart. And so when you pray, you express that which is already deeply felt in your heart. Let us note, also, that although the words of the Apostle refer to singing, his thought indicates turning in prayer to God. It is actually this that arouses the Spirit.